Hello friends, my name is John Donaldson. I'm a pastor at Burns Memorial United Methodist Church. This is the sermon for December 19th, year of our Lord, 2021. The scripture is that famous passage from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And it shall come to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place when Quirius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swallowing clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. The word of God, the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the 2004 movie National Treasure, there's a scene in where they unroll an old document had been rolled up and they unroll it and spread it out on a table. And they unroll it with great care and reverence. And in the movie, of course, the doc document is the original Declaration of Independence, a great treasure to be handled with care and reverence. I feel that way about a little bit like that uh, with this passage from Luke today, that this is a passage that as we unroll the scroll of Luke and look at chapter two, we're on holy ground, a sacred place, a play, a passage that needs to be revered and meditated on and memorized. Uh, just an important uh, part of the Bible. Interesting fact about the passage today, on December 24th, uh, 1906, a man named Reginald fin Finiston, an inventor and pioneer of radio technology, here's a picture of Mr. Finiston, uh, made his first ever broadcast, radio broadcast. He had tested the system, but he, in December 24th, 1906, was the first ever radio broadcast picked up by uh, East Coast nearby. He, he did it in Plymouth, Massachusetts area. And it was picked up by on the East Coast, out in the Atlantic Ocean by nearby ships and, and up and down the coast as far south as Virginia. Shocked telegraph operators were astonished that instead of the normal coded impulses, dot, dot, and longer dots, dot, dot, dash, through the wires, they actually heard a voice. And this voice, Finiston's voice, was reading Luke chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 7, the passage we just read together, followed by some Christmas music. He played O Holy Night on the violin and then followed it up with other songs. The very first radio program was a Christmas Eve program, and the scripture they read was the text which we just read. I just think it's amazing like an echo uh, of, the, of the songs of the angels. This is an important passage. When I was serving as a pastor in the Dakotas Conference, I had a member there named Elena Micklejohn, and she was uh, just a real solid person, good with numbers, was our treasurer, was a rancher along with her husband and raised cows in the James River Valley. She had this passage memorized, not just the verse 7, but all the way through the angels talking to the shepherds and the shepherds going to see Mary, all the way through verse 20. Memorized in the King James Version, the way you might memorize Psalm 23 or Psalm 100. She had this memorized and would quote it in our annual Christmas program. I asked Elena one time, what what did you memorize it for? Why, why this passage in particular? And she looked at me like I, I was missing something. She said, this is the most important part of the Bible. Jesus being born into the world is the heart of what the Bible is all about, Elena said. It shows God's love for humanity. And she's right, of course. Pretty deep thinking. So it is with some hesitation that I comment on our text today because it's holy ground. Uh, but I, I would uh, add a word or two, uh, just a couple of observations. First off, Jesus' birth is in real history. It's a historical event. It wasn't a uh, once in a time kind of story, a phrase used by Hans Christian Andersen or the Brothers Grimm. This isn't that kind of story. It isn't a story of myth or fable or folklore. No, it's a story of real historical event. 
The first person mentioned uh, in chapter 2 of Luke is a man named Caesar Augustus, who was a real person. Caesar Augustus says the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Uh, this was a real census. Went out to uh, evidently to find out how many people there were, to find out how much money. Uh, I think he knew how much money he wanted, and he wanted to see how 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 he had to divide it among, divide up the uh, the needed money among the people. And so it was a real census. Uh, Augustus lived, by the way, on our calendar. He lived from uh, 63 B.C. to 14 A.D. Uh, his name originally was Gaius Octavius, and he was the great nephew and adopted heir of Julius Caesar. When Caesar was killed in 44 B.C., Octavius inherited Caesar's name and estate, and probably most importantly, he inherited the loyalty of Caesar's legions. And so when there was a civil war following Caesar's death, with the help of Herod, Octavius defeated Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, and afterwards he changed his name to Caesar Augustus and would be the very first Roman emperor. On our calendar, his reign was from 27 B.C. until his death at A.D. 14. And Augustus' era was the era of peace, the Pax Roma, the uh, 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 nearly 200 years, around 200 years of, of peaceful time for the Roman Empire. Here's a map of the territory. The, uh, the yellow was there when Augustus became emperor. The green is what he added. The pink were the uh, states that became his servants, uh, subject kingdoms during his time. And so the Mediterranean Sea was the Roman lake. They owned everything around it, and Augustus owned it all. Emperor worship began under Augustus. Uh, statues put up him, of him by his servants all throughout the kingdom. He's worshipped as a god. He even had a month named after him, the month of August. In Latin, August is Augustus. Previously, Augustus had been named Sextilis for sixth month in the old calendar in Latin. And previously, Sextilis only had 30 days. But Julius Caesar's month, July, or Julius <coughs> in Latin, had 31 days. And Augustus said his month could not be any shorter than, Ju than, Caesar, than Julius Caesar's is. And so the new month of Augustus would have 31 days. They took a day from February to keep the count right. February, the Rodney Dangerfield uh, of months, no respect. Such was the power of Augustus. I mention all this because you see who's really in charge. If you read Luke, Augustus, who may have thought of himself as a god, was really putty in the hands of the real God. When God was ready for his son to be born, God wanted his son to be born in Bethlehem, and God had Augustus call for a census. 700 years earlier, that's how far ahead God makes his plans. 700 years earlier, God had told Micah the prophet uh, where the Messiah would be born. It says in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Bethlehem. Bethlehem means in Hebrew, uh, Beth is house and Laham is bread. And so it's an area in the ancient days where they would grow wheat. It was known as the house of bread. It was a wheat growing area. And it seems appropriate that the one who would be the bread of life would be born in the town of the house of bread. Uh, the Ruth story, the Ruth story is set in Bethlehem. You remember the Ruth story? Ruth and Naomi returned from Moab and they survived by gleaning grain following the harvesters. They had lost their family land and sold. And, uh, and uh, in order to buy it back, somebody would have to buy it for them. They didn't have the funds to do so in their poverty. And the person to buy it back would be a kinsman redeemer, somebody related to them a near relative who would buy it back for them. A kinsman redeemer, by the way, could also, in addition to uh, buying uh, land that's been sold because of debt, uh, they could also buy people out of slavery if they're related to them, uh, if they had been sold as slaves. A family member could redeem them. <clears throat> and so Boaz is there in Bethlehem, and he's of the same family line as Naomi, and he buys back the land for her family's name. He becomes a kinsman redeemer and buys back the land and marries Ruth. And uh, Ruth and Boaz, in time, have a son named Obed. Uh, 
Obed has a son in time named Jesse. And Jesse, of course, has a son in time. What's his name? David. That's right. David the king. So David's family is from Bethlehem. And so for a census, a person of David's family would go back to Bethlehem to register by family so that the census of Augustus brought Joseph and Mary home to Bethlehem. And by the way, I think it's fitting that Jesus, who would be the kinsman redeemer for humanity, is born there in Bethlehem. Now, Nazareth, where Mary and Joseph are, is 90 miles from Bethlehem. Mary and Joseph would have had to travel south along the flatlands of the Jordan River and then west over the hills surrounding Jerusalem and on to Bethlehem. A lot of uphill and, and downhill. And uh, they might have average maybe 10 miles a day resting on the Sabbath. It would be at least 10 days of camping out on the road. What would make something like that? Why in the world would somebody with a pregnant wife travel like this? The only thing that would make it happen would be an emperor's decree. And it looks like, at least it looks like to me, as if God had Augustus issue the decree exactly when he did so that Jesus would be born exactly where God wanted him to be born in Bethlehem. Augustus may have been thinking about this census earlier and God had him put it off. Or maybe he never even thought about, thought about doing a census until God put it on his mind. But however it is, there doesn't seem to be any doubt that God moved the emperor to do his will. I like to think that history, history, not all the details necessarily because we have free will, but, but the big picture that God has history in his hands and that you might even think about history as his story, God's story, that God is sovereign. And it's a comforting thought to know that God is ultimately in control, ultimately in charge. And that's one of the, of the messages of Bethlehem and of the nativity story, the sovereignty of God. You know, there's a lot of anxiety this year at Christmas. We're beginning another year with another variant of COVID. The economy seems shaky. The national debt seems up and inflation is up and and people have been isolated for a long time and, and tensions are, are up with China and in Ukraine and Taiwan and the Middle East and Iran. And we've been ravaged by tornadoes and, and some earthquakes in California and other parts of the world. What are we to do? But in this anxious world, Christmas reminds us that God reigns supreme and that all of us are safe in God's hands. Psalm 62, verse 8 tells us, Trust in the Lord with all, at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. Pour out your worries. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Salah. Isaiah writes, You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. You keep in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you on you. Isaiah wrote again, behold, my God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid for the Lord God is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. Friends, by Jesus, by God's will, by God's will, Jesus was born right where God wanted him to be. And right when God wanted him to be, even if God had to, had an angel whisper into Augustus's ear that it's time for a census because God is ultimately in charge and we can trust in him. So my first observation about the birth of Jesus is it reminds us of God's sovereignty. This passage, especially in Luke, reminds us of God's sovereignty that we can trust God even still today in our crazy world because God has a plan and he's still working his plan, amen? Secondly, this amazing event answers the question, how far will God go to reach his people? Friends, God, Jesus was born in such an amazingly, wonderfully humble setting. You know, a king ought to be born in a castle or at least a nice house. In today's world, uh, uh, the best of hospitals waited on the best by the best medical team in the world. But the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the son of God, where was he born? He was born in a stable. There was no room in the inn. And most likely the stable isn't a wooden frame barn. They don't have a lot of those around Bethlehem, but they do have a lot of caves. And caves were converted into animal shelters and, and stables. And so Jesus is most likely born into something like this, a cave maybe with a fire in the front 
and uh, with the crib and, and uh, Mary and Joseph in the back there. Why in the world would the King of Kings, the Almighty God, to be stoop, stooped to be born as a human being? And why in the world would he stoop to want to be born in such a humble way? Why be born in a stable? Why come at all? The late Paul Harvey. I don't know if y'all remember Paul Harvey. He was a news and commentator. He's famous for the rest of the story segments. Paul Harvey died and uh, passed on in 2009, 90 years of age. On Christmas Eve, December 24th, 2004, when Paul Harvey was just 85, he shared this message. He called it a modern parable to explain Christmas. Christmas. He said, the man whom I'm going to introduce you was not a Scrooge. He was a kind, decent, mostly good man generous to his family, upright in his dealings with other men, but he just didn't believe all that incarnation stuff with the church's proclaim at Christmas time. It just didn't make sense that he, and he was too honest to pretend otherwise. He just couldn't swallow the Jesus story about a God coming to earth as a man. I'm sorry to distress you, he told his wife, but I'm not going with you to church this Christmas Eve. He said he'd feel like a hypocrite, that he'd much rather just stay at home and would wait up for them and he stayed, and, and they went to the midnight service. So shortly after the family drove away in the car, snow began to fall. He went to the window to watch the flurries getting heavier and heavier. Then he went back to his fireside chair and began to read his newspaper. Minutes later, he was startled by a thump, thudding sound. Then another, sort of a thump. At, at, at first, he thought someone must be throwing snowballs against his living room. But when he went to the front door to investigate, he found a flock of birds huddled miserably in the snow. They'd been caught in the storm and, and in a desperate search for shelter, they tried to fly right through his large landscape window. Well, he couldn't let the poor creatures freeze uh, lying out there in the snow. And he remembered the barn where his children stabled their pony and that it would provide a, a warm shelter if he could direct the birds to it. So quickly he put on his coat and galoshes and trampled through the deepening snow to the barn. He opened the doors wide and turned on a light so the birds would not come in. He figured food would entice them, so he hurried back to the house and fetched some breadcrumbs and sprinkled them on the snow, making a trail to the yellow-lighted, wide-open doorway of the stable. But to his dismay, the birds ignored the breadcrumbs and continued to flap around helplessly in the snow he tried catching them. He tried shooing them into the barn, but instead of walking around them, but, but uh, by walking around them, waving his arms, but instead they scattered in every direction, except, <laughs> except in the warm, lighted barn. And then he realized that they were afraid of him. To them, he realized, I must be a strange and terrifying creature. If only I could some way let them know that they could trust me that I'm not going to hurt them, but to help them. But how? Because any move he made tend to frighten them and confuse them. They, would, they just would not follow. They would not be led or shooed because they feared him. If only, he said, if only I could become a bird, he thought to himself, and mingle with them and speak their language, then I could tell them not to be afraid. Then I could show them the way to safety and warmth to the safe, warm barn. But I, I would have to be one of them so they could see and hear and understand. And at that moment, the church bells began to ring. And the sound reached his ears above the sounds of the wind. And he stood there listening to the bells, bells pealing the glad tidings of Christmas. And he sank to his knees in the snow. A story from Paul Harvey. If only I could become a bird to show the birds the way to safety. His point, of course, is that the Lord did. The Lord came into this world humbling himself to become a person, a humble person, an approachable person, full of mercy and truth to show people the way to life and to peace with God. It took a person to reach people. If Christ had come, had been born into a rich and powerful family, he might have been unapproachable to the common people. He might not have understood them. Christ came instead, though, to a working class family born in the most humble of settings to, uh, uh, and would grow up to work as a carpenter. The Christ child was born so that he could reach out and identify with people, people like you and me. The writer of Hebrews put it like this. He said, God, who at various times and various ways 
spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Paul writes to the church in Galatians. He says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might have adoption as children. In other words, the child of God became a person so that people could become children of God. That's why we have Christmas. The child of God became a person so that people like you and I could become children of God. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen, and Merry Christmas to you.